Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. As we approach the winter months, we try to figure out what we can do out in our yard that might be able to improve the lives inside of our house. How about simply learning to grow your own pharmacy during these winter months, which is exactly the title of the book that we're going to be talking about today, which is Grow Your Own Pharmacy. I'd like to welcome to our program today our guest, Ms. Linda Gray. Linda, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Hi, Danny. It's great to be here. You bet. Now, let's talk about what we can begin to grow during the winter months that might be able to help aid in vitamin intake. Well, a lot of the vegetables that we want to be eating over the winter months, I would say we should have really started already. However, um, because we're kind of still in October, autumn, you know, there may be, it may be possible to still get plants that somebody, you know, a local grower has started or a nursery. So things like um, kale and collard greens, uh, any winter greens really, uh, because once you've got them in the garden, you can be picking them all through the winter months. And, you know, leafy green vegetables, you can't sniff that really, can you? For, I mean, vitamin content, it's great. Um, another thing, actually, that I think is quite an interesting thing to do for the winter is um, grow your own mushrooms, you know, because you can get some great kits available now uh, from good garden suppliers. And mushrooms are a really good source of minerals and vitamins. Um, and as many of them as we can get, as, you know, it's a good thing, isn't it, really, during the winter. Mm-hmm. Now, what is the best approach to gardening in the winter so that you can get the most out of uh, what you want to grow? Um, well, like I said before, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the best things is to kind of plan, um, you know, when you're planning your garden, to look at it as a yearly thing, rather than kind of think about it in the spring and then just um, plant summer crops, you know, really consider the fact that all all the year round we can actually grow something. I mean, I, I, you know, you can put something on your plate every single day. And one of the best things to do, actually, I would say, is if you haven't got anything going now, is to go for herbs, Um, you know, get some herbs going, because they really do, and and of course also, you know, adding different tastes to winter food is always a good thing. Um, And there's there's another thing, actually, I I was thinking about this earlier on, because, um, you know, you can get, like, potato planters these days, you know, barrels that you can just literally throw potatoes in, and they do it themselves, really. You don't have to dig trenches and what have you. And you can actually start them off at about this time of year or maybe a bit later. It depends on, you know, the climate and region. Um, But they come quite early in the spring, which is a nice thing to do. Um, I mean, so anything that really can can stay in the ground now. um, But I would say really planning. You know, a lot of people say that you can over plan. Well, yeah, you can, but, you know, to try and get the most out of your garden and to get the... best, you know, the best vitamins you can from your ground, it's a good idea to make some plans for the whole year rather than just the summer months, like I said. Um, and also, of course, at this time of year, there's, um, you know, we can be propagating new plants, um, you know, layering, get, taking cuttings, uh, dividing the roots, um, and also, you know, fruit trees can be planted now. Uh, ready for the ready for the spring months. So there's loads that we can do in the garden, which is a good thing because if you get a little bit of fresh air between showers of rain, it's a good thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now, what I really like about this book, too, for our listeners out there, it's to uh, learn how to grow your own pharmacy, is that you really categorize uh, things. What I really like about it is how you talk about, say, you know, the history of a particular thing. Uh, how to grow asparagus, what the site would be best for, let's say, something like asparagus, for instance. And, uh, you know, so it really kind of gives you a step-by-step uh, a detailed thing. So somebody just starting out really kind of has more of a running chance than just getting out there and sort of guessing, if you will. Yeah, well, I hope so. I mean, to be honest, that's why I, that's why I wrote the book as I did, because 
I know that when I started my garden, I had no idea, and I was consulting so many different books all the time. Mm. Um, but putting it all in one place for me, I mean, to be honest with you, I still refer to my own book because I forget things, you know, mm-hmm. like we do. Um, and, you know, it's just handy to have it all in one place. And like like you said, you know, the step-by-step thing. Because everything, uh, you know, all the, all the vegetables and fruits that we can grow, they all have different needs, don't they? Mm-hmm. You know, some need to be watered more often than others. Some need to be on sandy soil. Some don't like acid soil, you know. Um, so, I mean, just by knowing each of those and giving them the best possible environment means we get the best possible food from mm-hmm. our garden or even, you know, a balcony or a patio. Mm-hmm. Now, you can also grow a lot of things indoors year-round, can't you? Mm, mm. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, you do need, you tend to need a bright, airy place. I mean, if you've got a conservatory, then that's ideal. Um, or, you know, something, you know, a, a nice, bright, sunny room. But then even on the windowsill, you know, you've got a nice, sunny windowsill. I've always got herbs on my windowsill. I'm, Mm-hmm. There's never enough room for anything on there. There's, you know, pots everywhere. But, um, yeah, I mean, and a lot of herbs will stay green all the year round as well. Um, and in a lot of areas, I mean, like, for example, I mean, I'm in the UK. We can't leave a lemon tree out throughout the winter. It just wouldn't survive. Mm-hmm. But having it in a nice big container and that you can just wheel indoors for the, for the winter, it works really well. Um so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, taking into consideration the light, a lot of things can be grown inside, really. I think the one thing that you do have to watch, though, is the watering, because obviously usually in the winter months, we've got kind of, most of us live in centrally heated, well, you know, some of us live in centrally heated homes, and, and plants do, the soil does tend to dry out quickly, um, and it's easy to forget to water. So that's one thing. If you could set a little alarm system, it would be good. Mm. Actually, I think you can get those sort of things now, can't you? You probably uh, could, yeah. <laughs> things in uh, that you put in the soil that kind of buzz when it gets too dry or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, but you don't have to have a garden to do these things, really. I mean, subcrops, obviously, you can't, I mean... You can't grow apple trees indoors necessarily, unless you are lucky to have a large conservatory. Or, but mm. um, yeah, a lot of things you can. Now, what's really exciting too is that as you take this approach, you know, you are gardening all year long. But in the winter time, a lot of people tend to feel a sense of depression because of gray skies. You know, not that much sunshine uh, like in the summer, the spring months. So this can be kind of something that could really pull somebody out of. I guess, call it that seasonal depression, because it actually gives them an activity of caring for something else. Has that been something that you found to be the case as people experience this? Oh, definitely. I think, it's, I think it's really therapeutic. I mean, the garden is pretty therapeutic anyway, but, yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and, and you can, I don't know, I mean, just being in touch with nature right the way through the year, you know, you get in touch with the seasons rather than, get dysfunctional disorders through them, you know, if you're in touch with nature, then you kind of accept things a little bit easier, I think. Okay, it's chilly today, right, well, you know, I'll put the gloves on then, or an extra jumper, you know. It just kind of, it's it's easier to accept it, I think, when you are outside more. Um, And I think, you know, like you say, I mean, it's, it's a nice feeling, you know, if you can pick... I used to grow a lot of winter lettuce, actually. I haven't done so this year, but um, it's a lovely thing to do because in the winter months, you pick a, you pick something that you would normally eat in the summer and just add it as a side dish, you know, have it with your meal. You don't have to make it a main meal, but just that taste, just those extra vitamins and that freshness, um, it can really perk up, you know, a great winter's day, really. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of crops, of course, that will crop right the way through the year. Mm-hmm. And that's a great thing. I, I mean, you know, brushing off the snow from your Brussels sprouts or kale plants and then picking them and eating them is just, oh, it's great. You know, it's wonderful, really. You, can, you can't really get any fresher food than that. Mm-hmm. 
Now, Linda, let's talk about some herbs that people can grow through the winter months. It sounds like you can pretty much grow quite a bit of them, uh, but that would be good for helping people maintain really good, uh, uh, you know, health so they don't get sick, you know, like mm. immune immunities, I guess. What are some really mm. good key herbs people should consider that they can grow in their house pretty much all the time to have available for things like that? Mm. Well, I'm always, I mean, I'm always sort of saying that, you know, your immune system, watercress, eat lots of watercress, but obviously that isn't necessarily an easy thing to grow in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, although having said that, you can, because you can, you know, pop, the, pop a, a stem into a glass of water and it will produce roots. Um, whether or not it will grow very much, I don't know. But things like, um, I mean, most herbs will give you some form of, um, help you know with your immune system. Uh, rosemary, for example, is a is an evergreen. It's it will it will survive through really severe winters, um, and stay green throughout the year. You know, and then there's I don't know. I mean, it does depend on the climate because if you live in a milder climate, you're going to be able to grow more through the winter months, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I've still got parsley on my on my windowsill. Chives, chives are a nice a nice herb to grow. Um, the the properties aren't as strong as onions, um, but they still are there. I think it's just a matter of you know trial and error really, because the the winter in some areas you just have a mild winter. I know in the southwest of England it tends to be grey and wet a lot of the time. And I'm in the fairly north at the moment, and it's, you know, cold and snowy. So, you know, we do have very different climates to deal with. Um, I mean, in some parts, you know, you can grow basil right the way through the year. There's no chance of me being able to grow basil right the way through the year, unless I keep it in a heated greenhouse. Um, But, uh, you know, I think most herbs really are a good... Anything that you can grow on your windowsill or in your garden... Um, right the way through the winter months, it will help mm-hmm. without a doubt. Um, and also, of course, it, it adds that extra extra touch of something when you're cooking maybe up a vegetable stew or something. You know, if you've maybe got some coriander still in the garden, coriander is a good herb to grow. It's um, you know it can reseed itself every year, and the, and also the seeds are great for pickling or throwing into a stew. And and they're good for you, you know. They mm-hmm. are really good for you. Um, any, I, th- I think going for lots of natural products and fresh products, I'm very sort of, oh, well, I'm not really anti-processed food because I'm just as good as the next person that's buying them. But I think, you know, the more you can steer away from processed and go for as much natural food as you can, the better, really. I think, you know, that just tends to build your immune system naturally. Mm. Oh dear, I'm rambling, aren't I? <laughs> no, no, it's it's just really nice to let people know, you know, what they're able to do, um, you know, as far as uh, being able to garden, especially indoors. Uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up in the winter time is because as we tend to be sort of shut in, if you will, you know, it's cold, it can be rainy, it can be gray, sometimes mm. lack of motivation is that as you grow certain herbs, I would think, uh, especially in the house, uh, maybe uh, all around the house, maybe not necessarily just in the window seal. I don't know if that's true or not. Certainly, you know, in lightness, but that you also have sort of an aromatherapy going on as well. Mm. Yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, it's it's great. I mean, because, you know, brushing against herbs in the garden is nice, but, you know, just sort of rubbing a leaf or two, around the house definitely much nicer than spraying with air freshness and yeah Mm -hmm. that's a great point now what would be some herbs that would be good for something like that um well anything that's that's strong that's strong smelling i mean lemon balm is a lovely one Mm -hmm. um to to, and mint oh there are some amazing mint varieties at the moment um i you know they're all hybrid varieties but they're great I've got some pineapple mint growing at the moment, and it really does smell like pineapple. Um, And chocolate mint. Oh, there you go. (laughs) My daughter's growing (laughs) some chocolate mint, and you would think that you're almost eating an after-dinner chocolate mint, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So you can really have a lot of fun with those. 
even your cat. Yeah, well, the best thing to do really is to see what grows in your area because individual plants, it's hard to really recommend because everybody, like I said before, you know, the climate is very, uh, even indoors, although you're growing indoors, different regions will, um, they will have different preferences really. Uh, but looking in your local garden suppliers uh, or garden centres, usually they sell the seeds or the plants that will grow in the, your area. So mm -hmm. that's the best rule of thumb. Um, but I'd still go for something exotic. I always try out something different. It's, uh, it's good fun. Why not? Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to growing, uh, how what does a person need to do to keep from losing any real nutrients in a plant, or is that just possible? Um, which means losing the nutrients from the plant. Um, well, it can be washed away. I mean, the nutrients in the soil mm -hmm. can be washed away by by very heavy rainfall. Is that where we're going to here? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if there is a, a very heavy rainfall in your area for a continued period of time, I would say feed the soil. Uh, Comfort is a good idea um, because it, it acts as a tonic in the soil and the plants can take up nutrients a lot easier um, but having said that you know if the rain has washed a lot of them out then it will need feeding with either an organic fertilizer or compost or whatever is available but we can protect the plants a bit from very heavy weather by mulching of course um, and also putting like small cloches over plants. Uh, I mean, you can make you can make um, home you know have a homemade cloche just out of a couple of pieces of wood or a bit bendy wire and put some plastic over it. And just pop them over your your plants o uh, overnight, or you know if it's particularly bad weather, just to give them a bit of protection. You have to be careful with that though, because the ground underneath can become mildew if you you know if that, it needs air the soil needs aerating so but that is but that is very possible and i i like homemade cloches actually because you can make them as big or as small as you like um and you know you don't have to you can move them about that's the, that's the best thing don't have anything too secure that you can't move about uh, but then having said that, you've got to protect them against the wind. You don't want them flying over next door's garden in the middle of the night. <laughs> Not at all, that's <laughs> for sure. Now, um, how can people find out more about how to get a hold of your book? And do you have a website people can actually go to and find out more? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, my website. Um, I've kind of only just started this now, but I'm getting into this blogging thing. So it's um, linda-gray.co.uk. Um, that's my personal website. I have got a gardening website as well, but, um, but you know you can get there from from my personal one. Oh. Um, yeah, and all all the books are on there, and I kind of try and put a few little tips up every now and again when I think of something that might be useful. <laughs> and just to let folks know too that in the book it's more than just gardening, but you actually have a lot of great recipes in here people can actually use, mm -hmm. so they can actually what they've got in their garden out and put it to use in case they don't have any ideas. Well, yeah. I mean, this is another thing, isn't it? We're so used to kind of, you know, quick and easy meals that sometimes you kind of forget what to do with these things. Right. That was one of the books that I used to have to consult when I was living off the land. Well, what shall I do with all these tomatoes? Yeah, it's great, but, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I did sort of uh, sneak in a few recipe ideas as well, so... I think what's uh you know what I what the listeners should understand too when you look at gardening is that you're taking that next step to actually have the kind of respect for something that you've grown to use it well to actually cook with an mm. intention and you know I love cooking myself at home and being as creative as I can to see what I can do with different things based on how they taste on their own rather than you know a mm. bunch of seasonings and sauces and so forth which are fine too but the thing is, is that, you know, as you said, people want quick and easy. And mm -hmm. you take a look at your lifestyle in a situation like that, 
And when you tend to rush life along, you tend to have a lot more stress, uh, you know, anxiety, whatever it may be. As you turn that around and slow it down, you realize that you can actually cook quick and easy, uh, which I find interesting when you really are in the habit of doing it. You know, uh, I slow cook, for instance, myself, and I find that I can make things almost as fast as if you tried fast cooking it. Tastes a lot better, you know. But it's also a very meditative process, which is really necessary, especially in the winter months. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's a good point, actually, because that, um, the flavors, we've, we've kind of got out of the, the habit of having natural flavors. And, yeah, we can buy sauces to just throw in a pan with all the other ingredients. But if you've got a few, I don't know, if you've got a few chives, for example, on the windowsill, you just cut them up. And then maybe you spoon, a, I don't know, a, a spoonful of creme fraiche or yogurt or something, and suddenly you've got this amazing white sauce in your mm-hmm. stir-fry or vegetables. And it actually was almost as quick as opening a jar. Right. You know, there isn't any, it's no time. It's just that you've got to have it there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um I think it's just kind of training, getting your head into it, really, in the first place, isn't it? It is, definitely. You think, right, well, I'm not going to buy the sauces. I'm just going to go for the herb tastes. And and like you said, I mean, that whole idea of cooking and getting into new tastes, I think it's very good for you. Not to mention the successes that you experience as well. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) So the whole family likes it. Oh, you're a real winner there. Yeah. The book is Grow Your Infomacy, and our guest today is Linda Gray. Linda, I want to thank you for joining us here on the program. Give your website out again, please. Um, It's linda-gray.co.uk. Very good. Linda, thank you for joining us on the program today. Oh, thank you. It's lovely to be here. You bet. Uh, I want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Be sure to learn how to grow your own pharmacy. That way you don't have to take pharmacies from anybody else. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's always good to do your own thing. We encourage you to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. We've got great information like Grow Your Own Pharmacy right there available at your fingertips. Also on our blog as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Remember, live your day past halfway.